Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Shvius chapter 8, Halacha 2. If you're following along in the art scroll, it's 62A1. We have a really interesting Mishnah, really interesting set of Halachot here. Gemara is fantastic. So we're going to be talking about the different uses of the Shvius produce. Now keep in mind, right, the Pasuk, in Vayikra 25.6, Leviticus 25.6, it says, The Shabbos produce of the land shall be for you to eat. So the question is going to be, well, you know, what is this idea of to eat going to be? And we've covered this before. The idea here is going to be, okay, eating we understand. What about drinking? What about turning something into a drink? Well, that's going to be a normal use as well. And we were also covering other things earlier in chapter 7 with dyes, but we're going to talk about uh, this idea of eating, this idea of anointing, and then we're going to talk about, uh, really you have to put something in two categories in your mind. You're going to be like, well, what's a normal use for all people, and what's a not a normal use for all people? So we covered this before with, with the medical plasters. So taking human food and turning it into a medical plaster is a problem because what happens is not all the people are able to use it. Only sick people are able to use it and healthy people are not able to use it. It has to be generally available for everyone to use. Even if um, even if they can't afford it or something like that, they theoretically could use it. So you'd say, oh, what, what about, you know, very, very expensive food? And, you know, not everybody could afford it. Well, somebody might be invited over to the house who's very poor, and then they can have it. So we're going to have these two categories of general use that everybody can have and not general use that everybody can have. And then we're going to finish up with Kedusha, issues of Kedusha. Now, we were covering before Truma and Meiser, Meiser Shani, and the Truma and Meiser, what we were covering before, we discovered, ah, Truma and Meiser, in some way, is less strict than Shvi'as produce because the Shvi'as produce is subject to Bjor, and Truma and Meiser, in general, is not subject to Bjor. But we're going to cover here where Shvi'as produce is actually going to be more lenient than Truma and Meiser, and we're going to learn about uh, some of the ideas about Kedusha, where is the limit of Kedusha going to be for Shvias in regards to Truma and Meiser? So a lot of really interesting things coming up. Mishnah starts off, says, Shvias produce was given to be used for eating, for drinking, and for anointing. So we know that that's specifically in the Torah. Now, the Mishnah has to add something new because we already know this. And the Mishnah adds the novelty. It says, to eat what is customary to eat and to anoint. Uh, so anoint, that could be like, let's say you make a salve out of olive oil to you know, use to uh, cure some dry skin. Or let's say you want to moisturize your skin. That's what anointing is going to be. And the mission is going to continue and it's going to say, you know, to eat what is customary to eat, to anoint uh, with what's customary for a person to anoint himself with. So it sets up a thing of like, okay, what's going to be normal? What's going to be normal? And then it's going to exclude um, what is not normal. So we're going to get into a case in the Gemara. What about rotten vegetables, right? Rotten vegetables, not normal people eat that, right? So um, the the uh, the Gemara continues, or the Mishnah continues, says, one may not in- anoint with wine or vinegar or shvias. Why would that be? Because... Um, yes, um, wine and vinegar were normally used in this day, says Arashirilio, for dressing wounds, but not for anointing wounds. In other words, it would be used, uh, the anointing is going to be used to moisturize the skin. So you might have thought, says Arashirilio, that the medicinal use would place them in a category of things that were customary to anoint. And the mission is trying to teach us that this is not the case. And because Shvi'as produce cannot be used for medicinal purposes, and we learned that in a previous Mishnah, wine and vinegar are not going to be considered products that are going to be customary to anoint with. And the idea is that you cannot anoint with 
anything that is medicinal uh, and you can't use it also to uh, soften the skin. So in the olive oil, the olive oil is going to be used for anointing, but that's going to be to put onto a wound. And since olive oil is normally going to be used for anointing, this is going to be permitted because, yes, it can even uh, cure skin. And yes, it is a food and it is a drink. Um, I mean, you don't really drink olive oil, but the idea is that um, it can be used to moisturize because it's going to be a normal use. People, it's common for people to put olive oil on their skin. My wife even uses the olive oil on her skin to moisturize her face. And it's going to be different than wine and vinegar, though, because, uh, you know, wine and vinegar is not normally used and it could only just be used for a medicinal use. So you're going to end up with this idea of wasting. Now, the, uh, the Mishnah that we're talking about here is talking about Shvia Sanctity. And we're talking about anointing in earlier times. And today, it's not normal for people to use olive oil uh, to anoint themselves. Okay, This Mishnah is talking about a day back then. Today, the customs have changed. Right, People don't rub themselves down with olive oil. They used to back in the day, but they don't anymore. I know that uh, there's writings in the um, about Roman gladiators and things like that, that after they went to a bathhouse, they would be rubbed down in olive oil. And it was customary as well to rub yourselves down with olive oil after the bathhouse. This was normal, but this is not done today. This is not a normal use. And so in today's day, it's going to be, says, uh, says Rabbi uh, Eliashiv, he's actually going to say that today... Uh, wine and vinegar and olive oil are not, you know, normally used for anointing, and it's going to come in, in. Even the olive oil is going to come in a case where, you know, even if you're using it for uh, medical use, you can't use it. That you can't use the shvias produce for a medical use to to rub it on you. And now the olive oil, uh, because it's not normal for people to do today, uh, it's going to take the characteristics of wine and vinegar. But in this mission and this time. This was a normal, common thing. So you have to separate that out in your mind. So the Gemara, is, the mission is pointing out that the wine and vinegar could be used as a, med a medical way to treat a wound or to, um, to, to get things ready before you wrapped up a wound. And you can't do it. You can't do it because it's going to be wasteful and it's not, you know, it, again, the average person doesn't, you know, rub vinegar all over himself. Only a person who has a wound, right? So the Mishnah is going to continue. He's going to say, but he may anoint the oil, uh, the olive oil of Shvias. Now, and the, the, the Mishnah is going to continue. He's going to say the same applies to Truma and Meister Shani. But here's the wrinkle on the next one. Shvias produce is more lenient than Truma and Meister Shani in that it was given for kindling a lamp. So, Generally speaking, olive oil of Truma and Meister Shini cannot be used to light a lamp. And olive oil of Shvias can be used for this purpose. So, yes, you know, there are roundabouts where, you know, let's say you have Temei Truma oil and, you know, the Bot Cohen mixes a little bit in with, you know, regular oil that's not Truma you know, can she light it? She's allowed to light it because it now becomes a mixture. But generally speaking, if you're going to fill up an entire uh, uh, set, you know, for, you know, candles and you're not going to dilute it with anything, you can't light it. And with regards to Shvias and Shvias oil, you can. So in this way, it's going to be more lenient. So we're also going to discover you know, some deeper points about uh, the sanctity, what has to, you know, because of, you know, issues of sanctity. So the Gemara is going to be talking about the part of the Mishnah where it's talking about what is the meaning of to eat, what is customary to eat. And we're going to get right off into the most obvious things of what is not customary to eat. And the first is going to say, we do not obligate him to eat 
neither bread that has become moldy, nor spoiled leaves that are trimmed from greens, and the Gemara continues, nor food that is spoiled or has a spoiled appearance because it is not customary to eat these things. Now, the idea here is that when the Torah is saying Baal Shri's produce is going to be for you to eat, it's not talking about something to be wasted. And so this is not forcing you to eat moldy bread. And yeah, moldy bread you normally would just throw out. The idea is that this is only talking about things that are normal to eat, okay? And things that you would like to eat, things that are good. So um, it's not normal to eat spoiled, rotten greens. It's disgusting, okay? So you could look at it and say, well, wait a second, I'm not allowed to waste Shafi's produce, and you know, clearly I must have to eat this moldy bread or spoiled food or whatever. No, you don't eat the spoiled food. You don't eat it because it's not normal to eat. It's not normal food. It's inedible. It's disgusting. So, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is don't confuse it. Don't confuse this idea of wasting and, and you know, extrapolate it out that you have to eat rotten food. That's not the case. So, again, it has to do with something that's normal to eat, not normal to eat rotten food. The Gemara is going to continue and it's going to say, and so too, to eat what is customary to eat, that's going to have this connotation in the Gemara where it says, if he desired to eat raw beets or to chew raw wheat, we do not listen to him. Rather, the idea is that if he's talking about eating something that's not normally eaten in a certain way, like, you know, nobody's going to eat a raw beet like an apple, okay? It's, nobody does that, okay? Um, it's not customary to do it. It's like he's not saying anything, okay? Raw wheat is a is a very hard thing. You have to break it down um, and you have to grind it. And it's really not fitting for your teeth to do that. You'll wear out your teeth. So if somebody wants to go eat raw wheat, we don't really listen to him, okay? It's not, you know, customary to eat it that way. And so we're talking about things that are normally prepared, things that are baked, things that are cooked. Yeah, okay, you know, you could be talking about something like an apple. An apple is normally eaten raw, right? But raw wheat is not, okay? It's just not edible. So we're talking about things that have to be edible, okay? We're talking about things that, you know, are not too moldy or things that are prepared in a non-customary way that people just don't eat it that way. And the Bryce is going to come to explain the second opening clause, and the Gemara is going to say, and what is the meaning to drink, what is customary to drink. And here, too, we have this, you know, leniency, and we're going to have another stringency. So the Gemara is going to continue. It's going to say, we do not obligate him to drink anigaron and is isagorin. So these, by the way, are going to the uh, Anagaron comes up a lot in uh, the Shas. This is going to be the, the beet water. When you cook beets, it's going to be that water. I think people turn it into borscht or something. So the uh, Ik Sagorin, by the way, is going to be vegetable water. So let's say you overboiled some broccoli and the water gets green. That's going to be where uh, they're going to they're going to mix in some olive oil and they're going to drink it. It's going to be like a stock. It's going to be like a vegetable stock. And so this Barisa is, is trying to show us that if he does not have olive oil, he's not required to go and force himself to drink this uh, plain stock. So this becomes edible um, when, you're, when you're mixing it together with the olive oil to finish it. And if you didn't have the olive oil to finish it, and it's not normally drunk by itself, but it is drunk uh, with some olive oil in it, then, you know, then, then uh, you know, we're not going to force him to, to do it with this idea of wasting, right? So again, we're putting on these uh, limits on this because, you know, if we didn't have the Torah law, the oral law, people would say, oh, you're not allowed to waste and, you know, it has to be something to eat and you can't waste this fierce produce as sanctity. So eat the moldy bread or drink this soup that's not prepared yet. Uh, drink this uh, beet broth, this borscht that's not finished yet. You can't waste it. But no, the oral law is there. And this is part of 
this like um, honing to like hone in on what is the correct behavior and what is not the correct be behavior. Gamara is going to continue. It's going to say, nor with its sediments, because it is not customary to drink these things. I'm sorry, nor wine with the sediments. So this is going to be where you get these like grape bits that, you know, like the skins that settle at the bottom of a barrel or in a bad bottle of wine, sometimes in the bottle of a bad bottle of wine. And, and they're a little bit gritty and uh, the sediment is not very pleasant at all. Uh, really, I recommend it if you find it in a bottle, just strain it out because it's really not very good. And, um, you know, the idea is that you'd say, well, wait a second, you know, all of this sediment, this is grape skin and maybe even some of the seeds. And so the skins, you'd say, surely it has shvia sanctity. And so surely if this is in a bottle of, you know, wine, and here you have the, the liquid, and here you have some of these sediments. Surely you can't waste it. Surely you have to drink it, right? This comes along and says, whoa, 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 wait a second. No, 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 no. Not with the wine and sediments because, again, it's not customary to eat or, you know, it's not, first of all, it's not customary to eat grapes like that. And second of all, it's not customary to drink wine like that. And because it's not customary to drink wine in this way and really the, the sediment in the wine is really not very good um it's 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 actually unpleasant so you know it, it, the oral law is not going to force you to say oh don't waste go drink the sediment because you can't waste this grape these grapes by the way that's something i imagine a karite would do i would imagine like karites would would do things like that or sadukim would do things like that but uh we Torah jews we we know better so the, the Gemara is going to continue, okay? And this is really brilliant what's coming up. The Gemara says, One who feels pain in his teeth should not sip vinegar made from Shvi'as produce and spit it out because it's not normal for healthy people to use vinegar like this. Again, we talked about this before with medical products, with the plaster. If you have a healthy person and he puts plaster on his skin, it's not going to do anything. And in fact, you've wasted, you've wasted this plaster. And that's going to be part of why you can't turn a, one of the reasons why you can't turn a human food into a plaster. Because again, it's not available to all the people, only sick people. And over here, somebody who feels pain in his teeth, it's customary for somebody to put uh, the vinegar on the teeth when he has pain in his teeth. And I guess that's sort of an early antiseptic a little bit. Um, but that that's only for a sick person, right? So you can't take Shvias vinegar and put it on your teeth because now you've taken it from uh, where it could be used by everybody and you're only using it for a sick person. And it's going to constitute wasting. The, the Gemara is going to continue and it's going to say that, uh, however, he may sip vinegar to relieve his pain and swallow it because people sometimes will sip and swallow vinegar for even non-medicinal purposes. So why would they be doing that? Rosh Cerulio says that during a meal uh, to enhance the flavor of vegetables, uh, people will uh, sip the vinegar uh, also to, to build up an appetite. And since healthy people would, would do this in this time, it's going to be deemed an act of drinking. And then the Shvi'as produce is going to be given over as drinking. And then even if you ended up desiring and using your intention that, oh, this is going to be a medical use, um, you're, still, you're still allowed to drink it because uh, the other people, as a general use, can do this. Okay, People don't generally sip uh, vinegar to stimulate an appetite today, and they don't really sip vinegar to uh, enhance the taste of vegetables. But by the way, if you do like cooking, uh, acids like vinegar or lemon juice are something that do improve a food's flavor. So the Gemara is going to continue. It's going to say that he may dip food into vinegar, and eat all that he needs without concern. Now, why would that be? 
because vinegar was normally used as a dip. And this is going to be uh, where it's like eating. It's like you're eating the Shvi's produce. And by the way, it's going to be allowed even if you're doing it with a intent for medical benefit. Because again, normal people would dip their food into the vinegar at this time and eat it. You see this a lot uh, still, by the way, in Chinese cooking. So uh, jiaozi, which are dumplings, uh, one of the ways that they're finished in the north is they have a very, very good black vinegar in, uh, in uh, I think it's the Shaanxi province. It's made out of uh, sorghum, which is like a type of wheat, and it gets very, very black. And uh, I mean, if you can find it with a hexher, it's very good. And it's, it's a little bit different than the vinegar that you're used to. They used to make vinegars also out of barley in the Roman Empire. Anyway, in uh, over here, they would take the, the dumplings, uh, which, by the way, uh, you can make out of chicken or vegetables, and you can dip it in the, in the vinegar, and it really will enhance the flavor because vinegar is an enhancer of flavor. So over here, it's customary that all people would go and dip their food in vinegar to try to enhance the flavor. And because everybody else has this as a general use, that this person can use it even if his intention is to use it for medicinal, uh, like a, a roundabout for a medicinal reason, right? Roundabout reason to try to go around, right? But really he's just eating. And so there's not a problem with that. Now, the Gemara is gonna continue, it's gonna say similarly, one who feels pain in his throat may not uh, bathe or wash out his throat with the shvius oil, but he may pour a lot of oil into uh, a nigaron and swallow it. So again, we covered this. This beet water, which by the way is like borscht, uh, it was customary to eat it with a lot of olive oil. And so while normally you would take olive oil and you would rinse it around your throat if you had a sore throat and uh, the oil actually ends up as an antiseptic to end up killing a lot of the bacteria. Uh, there's there's actually some uh, research that is from like main mainstream uh, mainstream uh, medical sources, like mainstream institutions about olive oil and and its ability to help uh, lower bacteria growth uh, in the mouth. And uh, I think they do it also for like teeth whitening a little bit. Uh, there's a thing about that as well, that they, they wash it around their mouth very, very well. And so it it's used to coat the throat, make the throat feel better. But you can't do it because, again, now you've taken Shafias olive oil and you're using it in a, in a use that is now medicinal and it's not available to everybody. Again, you have to do something where it's available to all the Jews. And now you're just making it available only to the sick Jews. This is going to be considered wasting. So the idea here, the, the, the way to get around it, is you put in a lot of olive oil into your beet water, into your uh, nigaron, uh, and then what you do is you swallow it. And that way you've effectively got a lot of the olive oil into your into your throat. So it's not normal, by the way, for somebody to drink uh, regular olive oil. Okay, the idea is that you're not going to consider, uh, you know, drinking the olive oil on itself to be an act of drinking. You're going to say, no, this is really, you know, you're really like trying to wash out your mouth, and it's really a medical thing. It's not drinking. What this is coming along to say, no, 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 this soup, this borscht, this this uh, beet water soup is normally consumed because it has a lot of vitamins and minerals. It's normally drunk. And people, you know, even today, they'll make uh, shakes out of beets and things like that. Uh, so, you know, they'll put in some olive oil to, to help temper it. And the idea is that now it's going to be permitted because even healthy people would drink this. Okay. We're going to get to the next part about anointing, and it's going to be a customary use for people to anoint themselves. And again, when we're talking about to eat, we're talking about things that are also related, like dyes, 
putting on perfume, putting on, uh, uh, putting on, uh, you know, like things to, uh, you know, maybe moisturize the skin. So the Mishnah was saying one may not anoint himself with wine or vinegar or shvias, but one may anoint himself with the oil of shvias. Now we're going to get into a brisa that's going to explain this Mishnah. And this, by the way, is in the Tesefeta 6.3. And the Brysa is going to say, One who feels pain in his head or from whom scabs developed on his head may anoint his head with oil of Shvius, but he may not anoint himself with wine or vinegar of Shvius. So healthy people will normally anoint themselves with olive oil in this day, okay, it's not normal for people to do it today, but back then in the Gemara time, in the Mishnaic time, it was common. So because at this time it was normal to, uh, you know, to put the oil on you and it was a permitted act, even with Shvi'as produce, uh, it could be done for like a therapy, okay, it can be done to moisturize, it can be done for, you know, scabs. And the idea is that healthy people do not anoint themselves with wine or vinegar. Why? Because if they were doing that to dress a wound, to like use the vinegar on a cut as like an antiseptic to kill bacteria, even though they didn't know what bacteria were yet, but they saw a general thing that if you rub vinegar on this open cut, uh, it will heal better and faster. And then they can dress it and wrap it up so that it can it can uh, stay clean. So they saw, even without knowing about uh, uh, you know bacteria, they could see that you know through trial and error that generally speaking this would be better off. So the idea is that if you're putting wine or vinegar uh, onto a cut or a wound, well, that's only for a sick person. That's not for a regular person. It's not normal for somebody to rub themselves down with uh, wine or vinegar. And so because, again, that uh, in one case where they have a scab and it's generally used where people will moisturize their skin anyway, and even healthy people and regular people or even sick people will moisturize their skin anyway, that's going to be a permitted use of the Shvias olive oil. But only sick people will rub themselves down with a wine or vinegar on a, on a wound or a scab. That's going to be where you're using the Shvias produce as a medicine, that's not allowed. You're not allowed to use it. We covered this before. You're not allowed to use Shvias produce as a medicine because, again, it has to be generally available to all the people. Now, the Brisa is going to talk about a related law. It's going to say one may not perfume oil of Shvias, but one may buy perfumed oil for anointing from anywhere during the Shvias year without concern. So the idea is that you're not supposed to soak fragrant herbs in fragrant, you know, in shvius oil to make it into a perfume so that the oil and the herbs will absorb and that then the herbs are going to go to waste. And the idea is that this process can be wasteful. And, you know, one reason could be, says the Rambam about this, is that the herbs will ruin the taste of the oil and it will reduce the previously edible shvius oil to the category of inedible oil, which is also going to be considered wasteful. So the idea is that, you know, you are allowed to buy the perfumed oil even from someone who is known to sell perfumed oil on Shvius. But in order to discourage the manufacture of these products that are going to involve halachic violations, the rabbis are prohibiting the purchase of such products where it says, you know, this idea of we may not support the transgressors. This, by the way, uh, we saw before in the Mishnah in 4.3. So if you didn't have buyers, then the manufacturer would end. There would be no market for it. So in the case of perfumed shvius oil, the rabbis did not find it necessary to stop the public from buying it. And the use of perfumed oil was very uncommon and the idea is at this time, there wasn't really a market for it. So uh, Rabbi Imi 
is going to understand this brisa that's going to be coming up, where it's going to be saying that you know one may not perfume shvius oil, and but one is allowed to buy perfumed oil from anyone, even someone who's known to manufacture and sell perfumed shvius oil, and the idea is that. Uh, you don't even need to, to worry about this concern that you're supporting the transgressors. And it's going to encourage the manufacture of these oils. Now, this is going to be, uh, it's going to be disputed. So again, this Brisa states this law. It says one may not perfume the oil of Shvias, but one may buy perfumed oil for anointing from anywhere during the Shvias year without concern. Rabbi Imi says, he thought to say that it means that it is permitted to buy perfumed oil even from someone who is uh, suspected of violating the Shvius prohibition and perfuming the Shvius oil. Rabbi Yossi was going to reject this, and he's going to say to him, they said that the purchase of perfumed oil is permitted in the Shvius year only when the buyer does not know whether the seller is suspect or not suspect of manufacturing and selling perfumed Shvius oil. But if it is certain that the seller is suspect of manufacturing and selling the perfumed Shvius oil, it is prohibited. You're not allowed to buy the perfumed oil from him during the Shvius year. So the the Brisa, so the, the worry here about the, as the Rambam's pointing out, the worry here about the perfumed Shvius oil is going to be that you've actually degraded an edible oil. You took an edible oil that was perfectly fine for eating it, and you soaked these herbs in it to make it a perfume, but um, you you had something that was edible, and now you've made it into something that's not edible. Very nice that you're you're going to be able to anoint yourself, but you've effectively degraded it. And the Rambam is basically going to be considering this to be inedible. I'm sorry, to be this inedible oil is going to be considered to be wasteful. So... What the Brisa was just talking about is talking about this prohibition of perfuming Shvius oil with fragrant spices. Now, it's not; uh, it does not talk about the law of spicing Shvius wine, and this is going to stand in the contrast of of the Mishnah dealing with Trumos and Meiser. So, over there in the Mishnah in Trumos eleven one, and also by the way in Meiser Shini two one. It's going to talk about how uh, you're prohibited from taking and perfuming the Truman Meister Shini oil, uh, but they're going to be allowed to spice the Truman Meister Shini wine. So one of the things that they used to do uh, with the Truma, uh, well, sorry, with wine, it was customary to do, they would make a drink where they would put in peppercorns and they would also put in uh, carobs, and it would sweeten and spice the wine, and it was considered a very delicious dessert wine. The Gemara is going to inquire, it's going to say, what is the law with respect to spicing the wine of Shvius? And so over there, we know that you're not allowed to make perfume out of the Truma olive oil, the Meister Shini olive oil. You're not allowed to put in, say, rosemary and things like that, and then use it to uh, to put on yourself, you are allowed to anoint yourself with truma uh, oil and Meister Shini oil, but you're not allowed to actually make the perfume. Why? Because it's like you're you're taking something that was previously edible and you're putting it into the category of something that may not be edible. So you might put in certain spices that you wouldn't want to eat. So they are going to allow the spiced wine. And what's going to be the difference between the spiced wine? And, by the way, regarding Shvius, are you going to allow to spice this? The Gemara is going to ask and it's going to say, what is the law with respect to spicing the wine of Shvius? And the question is, is it going to be allowed in the cases like, you know, the Truma and Meister Shini wine or not? So we know that you can spice the Truma and Meister Shini wine, but what about the Shvius wine? Is that going to have a restriction or is it going to be allowed just like this? The Gemara is going to resolve it and it's going to say, let us learn the law from the following segment of the Mishnah. It's going to say, Shvius produce was given for eating, for drinking, and for anointing. And the same applies 
to Truma and Meiser Shini. And the Gemara continues and says, Shia's produce is more lenient than Truma and Meiser Shini, and that it was given over for kindling a lamp. Now the idea here is that the Mishnah is not contrasting this with any instance in which Truma and Meiser Shini are more lenient than Shia's produce. It's just implying that any leniency applicable to Truma and Meiser is also going to apply to Shvius produce. Now, we, we already learned this before, right? Uh, Shvius is going to have uh, Bjor, and Truma and Meiser Shini is not subject to Bjor. That's not something that's implicit, but it is implicit in Shvius. What this Gemara is trying to teach us is that if you have a leniency over in Truma and Meiser, it's also going to apply to Shvius produce. Okay, that's a really uh, important thing. And you know, the Vilna Gaon says about this that if Truma and Meister Shini were more lenient than Shvius in any respect, then the Mishnah would have not failed to mention it. So the Vilna Gaon is saying that if it were a case where Shvius produce were all, always treated more leniently than uh, Truma and and the uh, Meister Shini, he's Vilnagon's basically saying that it would have just written the Mishnah is saying that that uh, Shvius is always more lenient, but we know that's not the case. Shvius produce is subject to Bjor, and Truma and Meister Shini does not have this restriction of Bjor. So, in other words, by the Mishnah writing it as saying that. Uh, Truma and Meister Shini are more lenient than Shvius produce. The idea here is that any leniency regarding Truma and Meister is also going to go on the Shvius produce. Now the Gemara is going to continue. It's going to say that this tells us in effect that it is allowed to spice Shvius wine. Why? Because just like you're allowed to spice Truma and Meister Shini wine, and that's a leniency over there, the, this mission is telling us that if there's a leniency over there with Truma and Meiser, it's also going to apply with the Shvius as well. Therefore, you're allowed to spice the Shvius wine. Now, the Gemara is going to is going to show a contradictory teaching, and the Gemara is going to say, "But it was taught in Abraisa; it is prohibited to spice Shvius wine." And that's going to be posed as a question, and the Gemara is going to answer. Rabbi Elazar says, "Our Mishnah." Uh, this, by the way, is Rabbi uh, Elazar, who is the st student of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Elazar is saying that our Mishnah, which implies that the spicing of Shvius wine is permitted, and that is reflective of the opinion of Rabbi Yuda, while the Baraisa, which prohibits the spicing of wine, reflects the opinion of the Tanakhama. So this is really why you need to study with the Gemara, because there's a dispute here. This is a, a, a very famous dispute. This is going to come up in uh, your Shalmi in, in Shrumos 2.3. It also comes up in 11.1. And the debate goes like this, okay? Are you allowed to take wine that's, you know, that's uh, Truma wine, and are you allowed to cook it? Now, Why? Why would you cook it? Well, I, I put wine in my cooking all the time, and it makes the wine, it makes the food taste better. Also, very common in in French cooking and in in uh, even in Japanese cooking, where they will take sake and they will put it into the food to to enhance it. It does enhance it. So over there, Rabbi Yuda is going to allow a Cohen who gets a Truma wine and cook with it. Why? Because, you know. He can do with it what he wants, and the idea is he wants to enhance the flavor of the food. And Rabbi Elazar over there, uh, I'm sorry, the Tanakama over there are not allowing it. Why? Because you've you've shrunk the wine, and now you've reduced the number of people who could potentially drink the wine, and some of the people might not like the taste of of cooked wine, or they may not like. The wine that was used to uh, to flavor, to uh, you know, to flavor the the food. In other words, you had according to the Tanakama, let's say you had a bottle of wine, and you know, according to 
Rabbi Yuda, this Cohen wants to take the bottle of wine and pour it into a pot of chicken and onions and everything else and cook a really delicious French-style dish. Okay, but the problem is you could have had five people drink a bottle of wine. And now maybe only two people can eat from this chicken. You've, you've reduced the number of Kohanim who can do it. You've destroyed the produce. And over here, uh, this is going to have the same argument. In other words, over here, spicing the wine of Truma or Shvias is also going to be hinging on this, this debate. By the way, I want to finish this Gemara. The Gemara says, for in the Mishnah and Trumos, it states that one may not cook uh, wine of Truma because it reduces it. But Rabbi Yuda says this Gemara permit, permits it because it enhances the wine. Okay, so you could also be talking about mevushal, right? Where, where you've you've cooked the wine, um, so that um, some people might think it's actually better, um, or they might see it as an enhancement. And the idea is that you know if you're going to do it as mevushal, where you've cooked it and you've you've um, you know, some people might say you've enhanced this wine. And the Tanakhama are saying, yeah, but less people, fewer people can go and drink this wine. That's going to be the debate. Over here, the implication is that spicing the wine is going to be allowed. That's going to be the opinion of Rabbi Yuda. Why? Rabbi Yuda is going to say that you can cook the Truma wine or cook with it. And that's going to be where, you know, you've made an enhancement. And the brisa over here, by the way, is going to not allow the spicing of wine. Why? It's going to follow the same opinion of the rabbis who prohibited cooking with the wine, because not everybody will like the taste of this uh, product. And maybe not everybody likes it. And so now you've come into a category where you've destroyed produce, whereas before this wine was generally available to everybody. And now maybe not everybody wants this spiced wine anymore. So that's going to go by the Tanakama, and the Halakha is going to go by the Tanakama. So the Brisa here is going to stand where it's going to say that it is prohibited to spice the wine of Shvias. But what did we learn here? We learned, as the Vilna Gon points out, that you know any leniency. This mission is trying to teach us that any leniency that you know is applicable to Truma and Meiser is also going to be to Shvias. Okay. And, you know, because again, Vilna Gon points out that if Shvius was always more leniently than Truma and Meiser, then the Mishnah would have just said Shvius is always more leniently treated than Shvius and Meiser, than Truma and Meiser. So it doesn't really say that. And that's, that's the brilliance here. So the idea is that, you know, as you have any leniency over there in Truma and Meiser, you'll also have in Shvius produce. Now, the wrinkle over here is what about the spiced wine? This spiced wine is reflective, says this Gemara, of the opinion of whether you can cook the wine or not. And the cooked wine, uh, whether you're going to do it mavushal, not everybody is going to like it, or you're going to have a smaller quantity of it. And so it's going to be considered wasting. So the Gemara is going to say over here, as Bryce says, that it's prohibited to spice the wine. And the idea is that, you know, not everybody's going to like this spiced wine. It's not going to be generally available to everybody. And so over there, because you're, you're not allowed to, according to the Tanakama, over there, because you're not allowed to uh, cook the wine because you've reduced the number of drinkers and also because you've changed the wine into something where the people might not like the taste of that cooked wine anymore. Well, then what will happen is, uh, you know, you you have a restriction, you're not allowed to do it. And so over the, over here, you know, you're going to have a restriction on the Shvias as well because there's no leniency to cook this wine, according to the Tanakama. So we learned two things about this. The Mishnah is going to move on. And the Mishnah states that Shvias produce is more lenient, uh, lenient than Truman Meiser in that it was given uh, for kindling a lamp. Now, the Gemara is going to ask, but... Was Truma not also given to kindle a lamp? In other words, you know, surely the question is, you know, is somebody allowed to kindle a lamp with the Truma oil? 
And, you know, that's going to be, um, that's going to be the question. Now, in Bavli, Shabbos 25a, it's going to, and the Mara Fulda over there is going to comment on it. He's going to say that the verse from Numbers 18.8 says, I have given you the safeguard of my Truma offerings. And he's going to say that's explained as teaching that Truma is given to, to you. And that's going to, this to you is going to be to use as you see necessary, even for fueling a flame. Now, the Gemara is going to answer that. It's going to say, uh, Truma, that is Teme, was given for kindling a lamp. But Truma, that is Tahor, by the way, may not be used to kindle a lamp. Now, with respect to Shvi'as produce, however, even that which is Tahor is given to kindle a lamp. In other words, over here, Shvi'as produce uh, can be used without any problem, without any restriction at all, to kindle a lamp, whether it's tame, tahor, it doesn't matter. So, the in this way, Shvi'as produce is going to be more lenient, uh, more lenient than Shuma, with regards to kindling lamps. Now, the Gemara is not talking about kindling with Meiser Shini oil, and the Torah over in Devarim twenty six fourteen says that it is forbidden to kindle lamps with Meiser Shini, that is tame, and that's going to imply that. It is permitted to kindle with Meiser Shini, that's Tahor. So the Vilna Gon says about this that the law of kindling with Meiser Shini is the opposite of that kindling with Truma. Oil of Truma, says the Vilna Gon, may be used as fuel for kindling only when it is Teme, but the oil of Meiser Shini may not be used as fuel for kindling only when Tahor. And the Rosh is going to explain that when the Mishnah is stating that Shvi'as produce is more lenient than Truma and Meister Shini with regards to kindling, it means like this. The Rosh is saying that when Truma may be used for kindling only when Teme uh, and Meister Shini only when Tahor, Shvi'as oil can be used whether it is Teme or Tahor. And this means that it's going to be more lenient than Truma and Meister Shini. Notice here that the, the Mishnah says Truma and Meister Shini oil. And the halaha on the Truma is that it can only be burned when it's Teme. The Meister Shini, because of this restriction in Devarim, can only be used to light when it is Tahor. And this leniency here is teaching us, says the Rosh, that whether the, the Shvi'as oil is Teme or Tahor, you can light it. But notice that when you are lighting the oil, if it's Truma and Meister Shini, that's going to be opposites. And that is why it's going to mention in the Mishnah both the Truma and the Meister Shini. And wow, how precise is the Mishnah. Really, really amazing stuff. Now, Gamar is going to be answering about this. And the the Gemara says, Truma that is Teme was given for kindling a lamp, but Truma that is Tahor may not be used for kindling. And respect to the Shvi'as produce, uh, even that which is Tahor was given to kindle a lamp. Now the Gemara is going to talk about an incident regarding anointing oneself with the oil of Shvi'as. So Rabbi Hiskia went to bathe in the bathhouse. And he gave a flask of Shvi'as oil to Zasimi, a bathhouse attendant, and said to them, bring it to me in the inner room. Now, we learned this in Barachot. In the bathhouse, there are three chambers. There is an outer room where you're going to enter and you're going to pay and you're going to put up some of your things. There's an inner room where you're going you're to take off your clothes. And then there's a final inner room where you're actually going to go into the bathhouse. That's where you're actually naked. So the he he gives it to the to the bathhouse attendant in the beginning uh, where you know you you pay and you know you you first enter and he you know he's saying he wants to anoint himself with it in the in this third inner room when he's actually naked. 
And Zasimi says to Rabbi Haskia, is it not prohibited to anoint oneself with Shvius oil in the inner room? And the Gemara is going to finish up. And Rabbi Haskia, after leaving the bathhouse, came and asked Rabbi Yermia the law. And Rabbi Yermia told him that it is indeed prohibited. So that's a shocker. So that's a shocker that you can't use that oil when you're naked. And Rabbi Hiskia comes back to Zasimi and says to him, by questioning me and causing me to inquire further, you have, in effect, taught us a law. And the Gemara concludes, and so it was taught in a Barisa, one may not anoint himself with Shvius oil inside the bathhouse in the innermost room, but he may anoint himself outside and then enter the innermost room of the bathhouse. So what's going on over here? So the idea is that, you know, even the oil, you know, you know, when it's still moist on the body and you're, you're doing it in a case where, you know, the oil is going to still be treated in a more respectful way because, you know, you're not, you know, generally, you know, in this area that's everybody's naked and, and, and like that, you're in an area that's sort of more, more snua in the second of the third chambers. And the uh, Gemara is going to continue, is going to say, but he may anoint himself outside and then enter to the innermost most room of the bathhouse. And so too, one may not kindle a lamp with truma oil that is teme and must be burned, neither in the synagogues nor in the study halls because of the disgrace of the holies. So the idea is that truma that becomes teme is prohibited to be consumed by Kohanim. It has to be burned. And it's going to fall into this category of oil that has to be burned. And the oil does not need to go to waste. Now, the Torah is going to permit a Kohen to benefit from truma that is teme while burning it. So he may kindle a lamp with it or cook with it. But this Bryce is teaching us something else. It's saying that it may not be used to kindle lamps in a study hall or a synagogue. And the reason is going to be that just like uh, you're prohibited to anoint yourself with a shvius oil in the inner room of the bathhouse because it ends up being a disgrace to the sanctity of the shvius oil, so too you're not allowed to kindle the lamps of synagogues or study halls with this truma oil that's teme because it's going to disgrace in a public way the truma sanctity of the oil. And... The Rosh is going to comment that he does not understand the Bar Bryce's ruling with respect to Truma because the the Mishnah in Tractate Trumas 11.5 explicitly permits using oil of Truma, that is Tame, to kindle the lamps in synagogues and study halls. And the Rosh Cirillo is going to suggest that the Bryce is referring to one who vowed to donate oil for lighting in a synagogue or study hall. And since he has an obligation to provide the oil, it would be a disgrace for him to do it with truma that's teme. And it would be like, says Rosh Cirillo, like we're paying a debt with truma. Uh, this is a difficult to understand um, one. Now, the uh, the Rambam is going to say about this that you know, according to this explanation of it being a disgrace to the holies, uh, the idea is that... Uh, it's really going to be that, you know, truma is prohibited for the benefit of non kohenim even when burned. And so the idea, according to the uh, the, the Rambam, in Hilchos Trumos 2.14, is going to be that the truma oil for uh, synagogues and study halls really should be done with chulin oil. And it's really a disgrace to take this oil that, you could you're putting into a synagogue and into a uh, into a into a study hall and using this tame truma oil because really the idea is that you're going to have non kohenim benefiting from it. That's going to be the explanation by the um, by the Rambam and and the Bill Nagon is actually going to end up amending this text because it's such a such a difficult to understand. Uh, sugya, the, the way the sugya is structured, the Vilna Gon re readjusts it. And the Vilna Gon 
amends the text and says, and not with the oil of Truma, neither the synagogues nor the study halls. And the Vilna is going to explain this brisa after this amendment to mean that one may not anoint himself with Truma oils in synagogues and study halls, and it is a disgrace for the holy to be used in this manner publicly. So the idea is that, uh, you know, sometimes these texts are uh, very cryptic and very hard to understand, uh, even for Rishonim, uh, because, you know, sometimes the texts are, you know, come to our hands as fragments, uh, or it's just written in, in shorthand, and it takes a lot of work to try to decipher the halachot out of the Yershalmi. Very hard to, to work with the Yershalmi. This is a good case where you can see an example of that, where uh, this Barisa actually looks like it's contradicting the Mishnah, which does allow you to take the Tamei Truma oil and burn it in the synagogue or study hall. And the Vilna Gon is actually going to be talking about how this is not to light it, but it's going to be to anoint himself uh, with it in these places, because it's a public disgrace of these oils. So that's two different approaches, uh, one by the Rambam and one by the Vilna Gon. Anyway, really important to try to go through these harder to understand sugyas and try to work on them to get the halaha, and that is really the highest form of worship that we can do as Jews. Have a great day.